Well, before we start, let, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, and we do ask that you'd help us to, to be attentive to it. Help me to speak what is right and what is helpful. And may we be encouraged and challenged, Lord, to, to walk with you through this new week. And we ask for your help in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we come to uh, these well-known, and they are well-known parables uh, in Matthew chapter 25. Um, there's three in all. Um, there's the parable of uh, the ten virgins, which Steve will be speaking on in a, a few weeks' time. Uh, the talents today, and also the sheep and the goats. And the context of these uh, parables that uh, Jesus talks about is, is after chapter 24. And chapter 24 of Matthew's gospel is all about the end times. And uh, the disciples at the beginning of uh, Matthew chapter 24 come to Jesus and say about the temple, this is a fantastic building. And the reason they say that is because they're quite fixated with Jesus still having an earthly kingdom and the things that are seen and visible are, are really what matters. And what Jesus does in chapter 24 is he says, actually, all this is going to be knocked down. Uh, the temple is going to be destroyed, and that was fulfilled in AD 70 by the Romans. And not only that, but the world's going to come to an end. And here are various signs about the world coming to an end, and you can read all about it in uh, Matthew chapter 24. What he then goes on to say is in chapter 25 is, well, how do you prepare for these end times? It's all very well knowing about it, but actually, we need to prepare. And that's where these parables come in parable of the ten virgins and the parable of the talents and the parable of the sheep and the goats. Now parables are a way of communicating spiritual truth using everyday language with pictures. They're usually very memorable which is why Jesus uses them but often and it's certainly the case with the disciples we can get confused about what they mean. So think about the parable of the sower. The disciples have to come to Jesus and say well, what does all this mean? I'm not really sure. Now, when I was asked to speak about the parable of the talents, I thought, okay, that's fine, that's well known. But actually, as I got into it, I found it all rather sobering. Because it's talking about uh, the parable of the ten virgins, uh, at the beginning of Matthew chapter 25, and the parable of the talents is all about God's judgment, not on the world, but on the church. Because the judgment on the church preceded the judgment on the world. And so it's actually deeply personal, it's deeply challenging uh, to us as believers. And Peter, who witnessed, St. Peter, who witnessed firsthand Jesus saying the, these parables, because he was there with Jesus, as Jesus was saying this, later reflected on this in, in his epistle um, in 1 Peter. And he says this in chapter 4, It is time for judgment to begin with God's household. Yeah, it's time for good judgment to begin with God's household. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? So, what he's saying is that uh, Jesus in these parables, the parable of the ten virgins and the parable of the talents is, yeah, there's a church visible. Those of people go to church. Well, not that many in this country at the moment. Those of people who come to church. But actually, how many really know who Jesus is? What are the signs that we know who Jesus is? I can't say too much about the parable of the ten virgins uh, because that would be steal, uh, stealing Steve's talk. But nevertheless, it's all about having oil in your lamp if you know the story. And it's really essential for Christians to be filled with God's spirit and to be watchful. And uh, that parable really is all about watching for Jesus, about being vigilant uh, for Jesus. And it's, it's really important we're filled with his spirit and we don't put off getting right with God. The parable of the talents is all about, if, if that's about vigilance, it's about being diligent. And he starts the passage uh, in chapter 25 and verse 14 with the word again. So it's a cat, it's, Jesus is giving a picture of the end times, the judgment on the church, and he's saying, again, so it's going to look and feel something like this, and he gives this account. Now, parable of the talents, a word about talents. Uh, the word talent, uh, talento, or talanta, sorry, the Greek word, is what's used. And 
although it's a weight, so I brought one here, good old one pound imperial measure weight, yeah? And um, what, what's going on here? Jesus is given a, this illustration about us being given weights of, of money. It doesn't say whether it's gold or silver, even though the latest iteration of the NIV talks about bags of gold. New Living Translation talks about bags of silver. It's not. It's just a weight of money. We're not told whether it's gold or silver. All we know is that it, one of the uh, servants got five of these, another got two of these, and another got one of these. Okay. And we've got to remember, although it's Jesus talking about a weight of money, it is a parable. Jesus is using picture languages. So when I became a Christian, I didn't get a bag of money for being becoming a Christian. Did anyone get a bag of money for becoming a Christian? No, we, no, we didn't, did we? So it's clearly it's clearly a picture language. Uh, and it's funny, isn't it, how the word talent has become synonymous in the English language with being a, a, somebody being talented. Yeah, that's right, isn't it? And it comes from this parable. It's actually grown, so much has been soaked in from the word of God over the history of our country that this word has got synonymous with giftings or abilities. And that's exactly, exactly how it should be because that's exactly what it means. Jesus is talking about giftings. So we talk about be, people having giftings or being talented, um, and that's great. And uh, there's, a, there's a show, isn't there, called Britain's Got Talent. Has anyone watched that? Yeah, yeah, a few of you have. I, I confess I've watched it as well, and uh, not the last, last series. And it's getting towards the end of summer, so it's gonna, is it going to be starting again soon? Oh, yeah, we've got that to look forward to, haven't we? But you know, you know exactly what it's about. Somebody's got a unique talent, and uh, they put on a show to see who thinks he's got the best one. So what about these talents? I think the first thing we can learn about them, and we've each got various, various quantities of these, right? This is, this is the teaching here. We've all got various quantities. Some have got five, some have got two, some have got one. No one's got none. Jesus gives these monies to his servants. What we can learn from these in verses 14 and 15 um, is that we've all got them, as I said before. And we shouldn't be getting vexed or worried if somebody's got five of these and we've only got one, we feel, because, you know, it's, it's from him. We shouldn't be worried about that. Um, we are all created in God's image. We're all useful to God. Some of us have got more of these than, than others. But that's okay, because only God himself has got the full set of these. He's got a complete bullion store of uh, a talent, and he gives them out. And the other thing we should note about these, uh, these valuable gifts from God, is that they do belong to Jesus. We shouldn't be proud if, if we think we've got more of these than someone else. Because at the end of the day, it's all somebody else's property. Jesus is lending them, yeah? He's lending them to us to do something with. And the problem, it is true, for people with a lot of talents, is they tend to think, well, oh, there's something bigger than me. I'm all right. I'm better than someone else. Forgetting that it's actually God who gives these talents out. And here's the other thing about we can learn about these gifts. Yeah, they're from, uh, we've all got them. They belong to Jesus. He's lending them to us. He's also entrusting them to us. The word he entrusts, if you read the passage, he talks about he entrusts them to us. He trusts us to take care of his property. We are effectively his agents, his employees, his ambassadors, the Bible talks about. We are his A-team. And that's a real undertaking if we think about it, and it should keep us humble. And here's the other great thing about we can learn from the first couple of verses is that we don't get more than we can handle. So he gives them out. He gives somebody five because guess what? They can handle five. Somebody gets two of these because guess what? They can handle two. And somebody gets one because guess what? They should be able to handle one. We won't be expected to do stuff that we can't do. And I find that a real relief. That's a real relief. So, these great gifts, 
They're from God, they belong to him, he lends them to us, he's entrusting them to us. That has an in implication, does it not? And the implication is, is that we actually use them. And this is verses 15 to 18. So the, the master goes on a parable. And this is basically Jesus. In, in Acts chapter 1, we read about Jesus ascending into heaven. Jesus goes on a journey. But in Acts chapter 2, we read about his Holy Spirit coming down at Pentecost. He gives gifts to his church, his initial church. And the reason why he, he leaves and uh, he ascends and he's coming back again, we'll come on to that, is to allow him to give the gift of the Spirit. For he's here spiritually with us by his Holy Spirit. Before he ascended, he was confined by time and space to a place. But now he's not. He's given us his spirit. He lives within us. He lives in his people. He's everywhere. And we are, as I said before, we are the A team. There is no plan B. There's no B team. There are no reserves. That's why we've got to use these gifts. And so two of these uh, chaps, the the person that got five get, uh, talents and the person that got two, they get on with it, don't they? We read in verse 16 that at once, so Jesus leaves and at once, there's no hanging around with this, they get on with it. They put to use what they've been given. And the reason why they do that is because they respect who Jesus is. They love him. They want to serve him. There is nothing more important in their lives from doing that. And so what happens is God blesses what they do. So the one with five of these gets five more. The one with two of these gets two more. And you can see when they get to present it, and we're looking at verses 20 and 22 now, their excitement of presenting to Jesus what they've achieved. Master, you entrusted me with five of these, it uses the word see in the NIV. It's a bit weak, that. I prefer the wording of be, be, be your five words. It says, behold, it's excitement. Behold, look, I've got all this. You gave me five of these, and wow, here's, I've got ten now. This is fantastic. I'm so excited. I want to show it to you. Similarly, the chat with two said, this is great. Behold, look, see, I've got another two. They're excited. Now, there's a few implications from this, aren't there? It takes effort to put uh, to use what God has given us. We can't lie in bed thinking it'll all happen. We do actually have to go out there and do something about it. And the apostle, the Timothy, had to be reminded of this by the apostle Paul. He writes, uh, the apostle Paul writes to Timothy, for this reason, I ask, remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying of my hands. For the Spirit of God does not give, make us timid, it gives us power, love, and self-discipline. Looks like Timothy was a chap who'd been given a gift by, uh, by God through the work of Paul. But it looks like, and you read the rest of Timothy's letter, that he was a bit scared of using it. He was young. He was perhaps worried about what people would think about him. He was worried about, am I going to be good enough? And Paul says, rebukes him, basically. You've just got to get on with it. You've got to take a risk. You've got to step out. You got to do something. Moses, if you remember the story of Moses and the burning bush, was similarly rebuked by God. Basically said, "Oh, send somebody else. No, get on with it." And it's understandable why we might feel fearful about using what we've been given for God. Are we scared to offer ourselves up? Do we fail, fear failure? Because not everything in Christian work goes right, funny old thing. Do we fear failure? Do we fear criticism? Do you know what? That's really understandable. And it will come. Fear and, unfortunately, criticism. Not everyone in the church is blessed with the gift of constructive criticism. Yeah? Let's put it that way. And uh, destructive, destructive criticism is not one of these. It's not a talent. Yeah? 
that can, that's definitely not what that is. But it does take effort. We do have to take a risk. And the other thing about these gifts, the other implication is, we're to use these gifts to serve others. Peter writing in uh, 1 Peter chapter 4 again, he says, um, we need to be, the end of all things is near, be alert and sober, so you may pray, love each other deeply. And he says this in verse 10, each of you should use whatever gifts you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's uh, grace in its various forms. And he talks about offering hospitality, which is a, is a talent, you know, to offer hospitality. And he says there, actually, uh, offer it uh, not grudgingly. Yeah, so you get the implication there that, uh, you know, uh, the other arts invited someone for dinner and you're thinking, what have you invited them for? No, 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 no. Because but it says, basically, that we are to invite people because it helps people build people up in Jesus. And he goes on to talk about speaking the words of God and doing stuff in God's strength. But the, the main thing is we're there to uh, serve others. That's, they're not for ourselves. The reason we've got these is to serve each other. Okay? So we've got to take a risk for God. We've got to step out. But we've got to serve others. The other thing about these, uh, these talents is they're a mixture of uh, spiritual and practical. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul talks, and it's quite a well-known passage, he talks about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. He talks about uh, healing, miraculous powers, prophecy, distinction between spirits, speaking in tongues, interpreting tongues. But he says around those, they're given for the common good, for the benefit of everyone, and he gives them to each one just as he determines. So some of these talents are, are, are overtly spiritual but there's plenty of other of these sort of gifts which are sounds fairly ordinary so in romans he says this romans chapter 12 paul says right to the church at rome we have different gifts according to the grace given to us he talks about serving he talks about teaching he talks about encouraging he talks about giving encouragement he talks about giving he talks about leading it talks about showing mercy. And he's just given an example. So they're very practical gifts. Not super spiritual, but they're both equally important. They're given out by God, and we're expected to make use of them for us. And the great thing is, is that when we step out in faith and we seek to serve others, and whether it's super spiritual gifts, gifts of the Holy Spirit, or they're very, in the world's eyes, quite mundane, perhaps serving in some small capacity. God uses those to build his kingdom up. You've got to remember that at the beginning, uh, when the Holy Spirit came down at Pentecost, there was only a couple of hundred believers in a, an insignificant part on the eastern flank of the Roman Empire. That was 2,000 years ago. But God gave his spirit, God gave these out, God gave them to his people, and his people have been putting these to work, and now there's probably 2,000 million people spread all over the world who will claim some kind of allegiance to the Lord Jesus. So God does bless us as we put these to work. Now then, the third key thing is, we all have to give an account. Verse 19, the master returns from his journey. After a long time, he came back and settled accounts. This is really sobering because guess what? This is going to happen. Jesus is coming back. We don't know the time. We don't know the hour. But they are coming back. And he says to the two diligent servants, the same thing, verse 21 and 23. He says, well done. You've been faithful with a few things relatively insignificant things but I'm going to put you in charge of many things come and share your master's happiness come and join the party in heaven here's a, here's a, a challenging thing though, the person with five got another five, you got ten the person with two got another two you got four, great, they got the same reward but the implication is 
And he says it elsewhere in the scripture, those who have been given more, more will be expected to get the same reward. Yeah? So if you're someone that's really been blessed in your life with lots of things, it's quite onerous. We need to be thinking through, what am I doing with what God's given? What about the third servant? Well, his attitude is totally different. The master comes back and he was not prepared. So what does he do? He makes up an excuse. Now, have you ever done that? Fail to hand the homework in. Yeah. The dog ate it. Yeah, right. You're one of them. Now, this is more serious than, than that sort of event. Jesus comes back and this servant was not being, uh, was not prepared and he makes up an excuse. And he makes up a really bad excuse because what he does is he says, he, he, he criticizes Jesus. He defames Jesus. He says, you're a hard man. So because you're a hard man, so that's a lie, by the way, because Jesus is full of grace and mercy. You're a hard man. Oh, because of that, uh, I was scared. So, um, so what does he do with the one talent? He, he buries it in the ground, uh, and he has to dig it up, and he says, here it is. Rather grudgingly, here it is. Not like the other two. Look, behold, see what God, how you've I've used what you've given me. So what does the what does Jesus say to this chap? He says to him, "Well, if what you're saying about me is true, which by the way it isn't in brackets, then what you should have done is the bare minimum. The bare minimum is to take this and open one of those zombie 0.1 percent interest accounts." Yeah, has anyone got one a zombie account? 0.1 percent interest. Don't yeah, you don't have to put your hand up. But you know what I'm saying? It's the bare minimum you can do. You don't even do that. He buries it, and so it's devaluing all the time with, uh, with inflation. Yeah. He didn't even do that. He was bone idle. So what does Jesus say to him? You're wicked, and you're wicked because you're lazy. And he has to give up. He says, right, I'm giving, take that off him. And he's going to the one that's already got 10. And he, ha he gives him a really severe judgment. It says in the passage, throw that worthless servant out into the darkness where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So who is the person with one of these? Well, it's basically someone, it could be someone in the church who comes along, but actually they just don't realize who Jesus is. They don't realize who Jesus is. They don't think that Jesus really has a claim on their life. They don't understand the worthiness of Jesus. So that he is worthy, he is the living God. He is worthy of everything we can do and something more. He ignores what God's given him, Jesus has given him. He says, I don't want to bother with that. And instead of like the other two, he just goes off and lives for himself. Well, what was he doing all that time? The other two were fully invested in the kingdom of God, weren't they? Using whatever God had given them, whether it was a large amount or a little amount, they were fully invested in who Jesus was. And they wanted to serve him. This guy just went and lived for himself, and he was caught out when Jesus returns. So as I said at the beginning, this is sober stuff. It's, it's a tough, tough parable. It's not, not nice stories in one sense because of the message. So there is going to be a judgment on the church. And it's right that we constantly evaluate, you know, our relationship with Jesus. On a personal level, Steve will talk more about this. Have we got oil in the lamp? Do we have the Holy Spirit in our lives? Are we watching out for Jesus? But are we, with this parable, using what God's given? I mean, like everything. Or are we just drifting through life? Burying it. Now, it might sound like this feels a bit like salvation by works, you know, um, that we please God by doing stuff, and, and then he'll accept us 
yeah? He'll accept us. But this parable is preceded by the one about uh, the parable of the ten virgins. The importance is you need to have God in your life to do this. You can't do this without God in your life. That's where the parable of the ten virgins comes in. So remember that it's not salvation by works, but faith. If we've got faith in Jesus, we will want to work. We will want to please him. We'll want to use everything that God has given. So what does that mean for us in this church today? Let me all think we're a, a congregational church. It's in the job title of the church, isn't it? And uh, it's not like certain other churches you, I could mention. I'm not going to mention them because you can work them out where you employ somebody at the front who does stuff, yeah? And everyone rocks up every week and says, yeah, very good, and goes away and just carries on. Now, we're a congregational church. I know a lot of you say, yeah, we know this, Neil. But our job here is to get involved. It's not just someone at the front doing stuff. It's all our jobs to get going on with what we can get on with. And there is no, I've just listed some things here and I'll have forgotten things. But it is things like coffee stop. It is things like the prayer meeting. It is things like the tech desk. It is things like the junior church. It is the creche. It is church not on a Sunday. It is playing instruments. It is counting money. It is maintaining the building. It is witnessing to Jesus with the neighbours. It is inviting people for a meal. It is helping at a food bank. It is getting involved with IAT in whatever way we can. It is leading a study. It is visiting the sick. And I'm going to mention it, it is, if we've got a secular job, just doing that well before non-Christians and bearing witness to him. The list is simply endless. We've all got these. The challenge for us is, are we using them for his glory? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. And Lord, it is, it's tough, your word, Lord. But we thank you that you give us grace. You give us your Holy Spirit. You help us to love you, Lord. You help us to use what you've given us to your glory. Help us, Lord, to suss out those things in our lives that maybe we're not using for you. Help us to be diligent and watchful. Lord, we love you. We thank you you've called us into your kingdom. We thank you you are coming again. And we know that when we are trusting in you, you will say to us one day, well done, good and faithful servant. And we praise you in your name.